Hello, everybody. Okay, this is week 12, week 12 of the Ecological Niche Modeling course. Um, we're into occurrence data, and so I'm going to give you some, some thoughts about once you have your data, and maybe once you have your data georeferenced, well, then how do you clean up your data and either eliminate records that are that hold errors that are potentially of importance, or uh, better yet, fix them and make them more useful. So let's let's go to my presentation and start into this. Here we go. Okay, so. What I want you guys to think about is that you've got a big data set. You want the data to be as useful and as robust and as clean as possible. Um, and at the same time, you don't want to clean it so much that you have nothing left. Um, we're going to give you a couple perspectives on data cleaning, and they are completely compatible. Um, in the next talk in this sequence, Tomer Guetta is going to give a, a talk about uh, biodiversity data cleaning workflows, but automated workflows. I'm going to give you a simpler um, set of thoughts, which are about essentially how would you do this by hand? Now, in most cases, um, I do things by hand because I have no quantitative skills and I'm I have no ability in R or anything like that, and all my students make fun of me for that. In this case, I'm going to defend myself. Uh, normally, I just shrug and say, yeah, I should have learned R. But in this case, I really think that a crucial element in data cleaning is getting in there and playing with the data and exploring the data in such a way that uh, you really find the little details. Um, so I, I strongly recommend this. I would say that if, if you're not doing this sort of analysis of your data as part of, by, of cleaning the data set, you probably aren't doing a good enough job. Let, let's jump in. And I just want to give you some frameworks for thinking about what are clean data and what are not. You know you can send your questions to um, this email but also we'll give you the link um, for, the, for the, uh, the survey where you can send your questions. Um, okay, so, fuck this. Okay, so I wanna emphasize that data cleaning is a crucial step. There are huge data re resources out there. Notice that when I made this slide a couple years ago, there were 650 million records. Well, just on GBIF, there is now double that quantity. So it's a huge amount of data that is out there and available. And I would posit to you that any data set of any size, like let's say larger than 50 or 100 records, is impossible to clean exhaustively, period. And so that means that error will exist in any biodiversity data set. And it suggests that you should take some steps to minimize both the quantity and the degree or the influence of these errors in any analysis that you do. So let's go through some published studies that have given examples of the need for data cleaning. Well, here's an early one uh, led by Catherine Graham. And essentially what we did was we took original clean data, and then we took those same data records, but shifted the, the position of the data record randomly in space. And this is back when we still used um, ROC AUC as a metric of model quality. We don't anymore, please. Um, but what you'll notice is that the distribution of AUC scores is higher for the original, the error-free data, 
or the relatively error-free data than for the data for which error was introduced. Uh, and then we explored that for different algorithms. And you can see that um, some al algorithms were more affected and some algorithms were less affected by introducing um, that, that um, error component into the, um, the input data. Here's another example of, of um, clean, the effects of cleaning taxonomy. And this was on uh, completeness indices for uh, Brazilian plants. And essentially what you can see is that the percent change in completeness between raw and complete and cleaned taxonomic records, um, modal records get 5% better, sorry, modal pixels across Brazil get 5% better um, when the taxonomy has, has been checked by experts. Or here, uh, we used three different levels of kind of quality of georeferencing. Um, in the lowest quality, we just fed the locality names into an automated georeferencing facility and used what we got. And then there was a second level, which was uh, somebody knowledgeable about African geography um, and using kind of online database tools to get geographic references. And then finally, we had a person go through and research every single point. This was for a disease called monkeypox, uh, but went through and researched every single point all the way back to the original notes from the doctor who was the attending physician when the case was, was diagnosed. And all I want you to see is these difference maps where uh, wherever you see color in the shading is where uh, the resulting model from the researched data showed more uh, suitability in a region compared to the lower quality data set. And all I'm saying is it makes a difference. Okay. Now the research data, say, data set for this particular study took a year and a half of work by the senior author, Brian Lash, to, uh, to assemble. It took a huge amount of work, but it does make a difference. So think about that and think about whether you are willing to accept lower quality data as inputs to your models. Here's another example for Lassa fever in West Africa. And in this case, we balanced error, we, we dealt with oversampling. Those are both topics we'll talk about later in the course. But here's the effect of quality control in the input data. Every place where you see blue shading is where without that step of quality control, you underestimate risk. And everywhere you see red is where you see uh, overestimation of risk. Here's the original um, map in the, another published study. Essentially, we were critiquing a published study and you can see this big gap in ostensibly suitable areas in the middle of West Africa. But by the time we finished fixing these three problems, the suitability extended continuously across West Africa. And that apparently is true about this particular disease. Again, it makes a difference. So do it, please. I think this is the final example. Uh, here is uh, elevation ranges for, um, for Andean and Amazonian plants from raw data versus from cleaned data. And what you can see is, again, the effects of data cleaning. These are not random errors. These are not things that um, don't really make a difference. They do make a difference. 
All of these studies that I'm giving as examples, I'll put in a packet so that you can read further if you care to. Oh, one more. Uh, this is from Tomer Guetta and, and Yohai Carmel, um, but this is essentially the beginnings, an early version of what Tomer will be talking about in the next talk. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I do want you to see that you know, here's a, essentially a quantitative assessment of if I start with a million records, how many do I lose to different types of problems? Or how many do I flag as possibly having problems, whether or not they really do have problems? Okay, let's talk about primary biodiversity data, just briefly. Um, what are primary, primary biodiversity data records? Well, they're, some, they're records that integrate three data dimensions. First of all, a taxon, some species. Um, I guess you can go to higher level taxa, but let's, let's say some taxon in some place at some point in time. Those are the three crucial elements. Obviously, there are other dimensions, uh, but these, are the, these three are the basis for a primary biodiversity data record. Now, the taxon data have a pretty cl close interaction with the type of data, the, the basis of the data record. That is, if it is a specimen record, then it's essentially always or almost always possible to go back to the voucher specimen and check it. With observational data, which are dominant in terms of numbers amongst primary biodiversity data, oftentimes there's no recourse, which is to say, the observer said that he or she saw this species, you either believe it or not. Now, when taxonomic uh, names are strange, like maybe a, a name that doesn't show up in your current taxonomy, you may well be able to fix it. You may, you may not. Sometimes it's, it's not possible. Sometimes it is. Place, well, we have the, the wonderful invention of GPS, and that allows us a qualitative 10 to 100 fold increase in spatial resolution. Um, so GPS is wonderful, but GPS coordinates need to be labeled as GPS coordinates if they're going to be that useful. And you also desperately need information on the datum and the precision of the coordinates. Um, so these are things that you've already heard about from John Wachorek and Mona Papish. Um, in other cases, we, we have coordinates that are derived from text, and that requires additional information as well, um, which is to say those text-derived coordinates require a full metadata um, record to be able to be interpretable usefully. I'll give you some examples of, of why uh, I say this. And we have a standard approach called the, the Manus Georeferencing Guidelines, and here's the link to that. Whatever the source, the coordinate data need to be checked. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a moment. And finally, time. Usually day, month, and year are the, the, uh, the data elements. Sometimes it's hour and minute and second. Um, sometimes we just have month and year, or sometimes just year. There are both internal and external consistency checks, which we'll talk about in a moment. But essentially, you can imagine these three elements of a um, a primary biodiversity record, tax on place and time. And to have a record be complete, we need all three of those elements in place. Now, there are all sorts of things we can do. 
For example, we can look at records of a taxon through time and look at trends. Maybe, maybe that would be reflective of uh, conservation status. We can look at records through time of sampling at a place. We can document just uh, the places in gazetteers. Taxon and place, well, that gives us the basis for uh, faunas of, you know, birds of, flowers of, whatever. But also it gives us the basis for most niche models. I would argue that if you're not checking the time, you're probably doing some dumb things, but most people don't check the time and that's not good. Now with real complete records, we can do things like inventory completeness analyses and most relevant to this course, we can do time specific niche models. We'll talk about time specific niche models late in the course. But let's just say that for full functionality, we need all three of those elements in place. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you kind of the ideas of a workflow that you could use. And this is all done by hand. And those of you who know me know that I work with a combination of uh, a GIS platform, a spreadsheet, a database platform, um, so I'm doing this kind of as by hand as we do things by hand these days. So really what I want you to see is that this is a way of thinking about consistency in your data records. And consistency is really the only hallmark of correctness and utility that we have. Okay, so let's look at this. Initial steps. Well, maybe we download some data from wherever, okay? Um, could be from GBIF, could be from anywhere. Well, first thing we need to do, we usually get way more fields than we want. Uh, first thing that we need to do is to get organized. And so I like to use colors. Don't have to, obviously, but here you can see I've put all of the time related columns in one color and all of the taxon related uh, columns in another, um, and then maybe all of the location um, records in another. Okay, so let's start playing with this. I'm not, I'm not gonna use the same data set for everything. I just wanna give you guys good solid examples. So let's look at taxon. And for this, I took all the bird records from Nicaragua. Okay, and first of all, I want you to just see there's a lot of garbage in, in a lot of these um, data sets that we use kind of offhand, you know, very, we, we believe in these data sets. But if you look, you know, here's a, here's a record that somebody um, identified tentatively. Or here, here are records that are just to genus, and here are records that are to species. Here are records that are to the same species, but specifying a subspecies. And this is all just kind of junk that you've got to clean up. Okay, we have standard and non-standard texts. Okay, somebody put in a question mark and parentheses. But we've also got here one that adds in an authority and also is a very old um, name. And so it took me a little bit of work to figure out that this record per pertains to Mermornis torquata. So essentially with, with taxon, we can look for internal problems like genus only or non-standard characters in there. But we can also look externally and we can ask, well, maybe comparing against an authority list, like maybe the IOC World Bird Names version 6.02, we can ask for every name in our database, is it on the IOC list as well? Or is it some non-standard name? So for taxon, you see we had some internal checks and we had some external checks. 
Now for time, we're going to go all internal. Um, although I guess you could do external checks as well. I'll give you some, some uh, examples later. But for internal checks, well, we can look for kind of dates that don't make sense. So we can start exploring our data. Oops, right away we see 0, 0, 0. 0 is often used as a, as a uh, placeholder for no data. But that's usually a bad idea because 0 doesn't mean no data. 0 means 0. Um, but I can do things like make sure that here I'm, I'm looking at months. And you can see most of my months go, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 12. But then I've got 18, 20, and 24 in there as well. That's a problem. And so I can take, well, take it one step further. Look at days. And it's kind of interesting. You see a big pile up, lots of records that have day zero, which probably means I don't know the day of the month or I don't know the day or the month of the year. But there are some things in here that make sense. Like notice that 31 is about half as frequent as the other days. That makes sense because not all months have um, a 31st day. Um, here are our month uh, designators and you can see zeros in there, that's not good. 18, 20, and 24 are in there. And then we have also these biases where it looks like there was a lot more sampling in December than in July. Well, okay, so you might want to take that into account as well as you are as you are developing your models. Then we can cross day and month. So we know that all of the month zeros and all of the day zeros are incomplete. We know that months 18, 20, and 24 are problems. But we also know that February 31st is a problem, or February 30th, or April 31st. Those are problems as well. We can also look for leap years and make sure that all of our February 29ths are in loop, leap years. And so here you can see February 29th, three of them, in 1970 and 1971, which were not in leap years, or here in 1965 and 1953. Although apparently you don't get a leap year when it falls, when leap year should fall in a century year, like 1900 or 2000. I just learned that recently. And then we can just look at year. Um, and here you can see the year 2965, uh, I think, had a record. Uh, we can see some years like 1057. And then we can see some years that are probably real, but maybe should be checked. Uh, there was also a, a rather unfortunate tendency to say, well, if I know it was 20th century, I'll just put it as 1900. So do notice that the year 1900 has a very high frequency. And sometimes people uh, will use the first year of a decade to say, well, somewhere in that decade. And you know, those are problems that you may be able to pick out. OK, so. Time, again, most of the checks you're going to do are for internal consistency. But there are the possibilities of external consistency, like if you get a record from the high Arctic and um, you're very doubtful of it, and this did happen, by the way, uh, you could check when uh, ice-free dates were for high Arctic islands and things like that. OK, let's go on to place. We can look at internal consistency via looking for missing data, but also conflicts between the text, like a record from, I don't know, Ohio, 
in the United States and the coordinates. And we can make sure that those coordinates fall in that state. And then I'll also give you some place uh, external checks as well that you may or may not be able to do. We'll talk about those under time versus place and taxon versus place. But let's first look at internal consistency of, um, of place. So we did a little bit of this in the question and answer session last week, but you can visualize the records that you have downloaded worldwide, and you may well find some coordinates that don't make much sense. This is from the University of Ghana Herbarium before uh, Alex Asase and I cleaned up the, the coordinate data, which was a huge job. Uh, but what you can see is some, some errors as far as very high latitudes, like maybe 1,000 or 500, and very large values of longitude as well. Let's zoom in a bit. Okay. Remember, 0, 0 is, is right here, and that says um, somebody used 0, 0 as a placeholder for no data. Um, but you can also see that the University of Ghana Herbarium has records from across the Afrotropics and maybe even into the American tropics. Let's zoom in farther. Now we see some things that should bother us. Um, you see this weird striping, and that took Alex and me a ton of work to figure out. It turned out it was um, an inappropriate translation of a record like 4.06, which sounds like four and six hundredths of a degree. It actually was an old data format for four degrees and six minutes. And so that, again, that took us a ton of time to work out. <coughs> now, some of these records are on on land and some of them are on in the water, but those may be marine taxa. So it would be okay, it's an herbarium. They should have some, some sea grasses and algae and things like that. Um, so those just need to be checked as to which taxon is ostensibly out there in the middle of the ocean. Now those are the records that are flagged as coming from Ghana. Now we've got some problems. Here's Ghana, and here's its territorial waters, but this is Cote d'Ivoire, and this is Benin, and this is Nigeria. We've got some inconsistencies here. Again, the coordinate may look fine, but something in that record, either the coordinate or the country designation, is wrong. That's an inconsistency. So we can do a generalized look for this by essentially saying, well, I have a data record that includes latitude and longitude coordinates and a country field. Well, I can use in any GIS, I can use you know, extract value to point or grid coring or um, uh, point sampling tool, but I can essentially attach or, or a spatial join. I can attach the value of what country is at each latitude longitude uh, coordinate to that point. And then I can ask whether the country designation in the original data record matches the country where the coordinate falls. So here's a result of doing something like that. These are records where the country name in the data record was Ghana, but it didn't fall in any country, which is to say it fell out in the ocean. And so those are just ones where you would probably want to check and make sure it's a marine or uh, yeah, a marine taxon. Other cases, you know, here's a record that says Ghana and falls in Togo, a record that says Benin and falls in Cameroon. Some of those records are gonna be right along the border and they may just be a, 
a problem of, of resolution or something like that. But others, like the record that was labeled as coming from Benin and the coordinates fall in Cameroon, those are not neighboring countries. So there has to be a problem either with the country designation or with the coordinates. It would behoove us to check. So here's another example going back to Nicaragua. And this is for the, the first administrative division uh, within Nicaragua, I think they're departments, I don't remember well. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna color each point by the name it has for the administrative division. And so for example, this division, we only have these black crosses, oops, except there's one of them out here. And let's see, this division is all black dots, except one of them is over here. And then this division is just a complete mishmash of all sorts of different designations. So maybe it's just an issue with the de designations as to department or administrative division within the country. Or maybe we have a real problem. Here's a, here's a division that's entirely consistent. Great. But these other ones, something's wrong with those records, and you probably ought to check and make sure it's not the coordinates. Okay? And when I say check, you go back to the original data record and see what the textual description is. Okay, here's a real wild one. Um, I include this one just to see to show you the lengths to which you can go if you, um, if you really want to be careful with your data. And this is using collector itineraries. So with my colleague Adolfo Navarro and a, a good friend, Ricardo uh, Pereira, um, Adolfo and I had assembled essentially a comprehensive database of all Mexican bird specimen records. And so we could do things like take an, an individual collector, in this case, Alan Phillips, and we just took him, his records for the first few days of October in 1955. And what you can see is that between the 5th and the 10th of October, he was doing a lot of collecting in the state of Nayarit. And a few days before, he was up in Sinaloa. That's fine, you could travel this distance in a day or two. However, on the 8th, he was also supposedly collecting in central Guerrero. Notice there's a Nayarit point, point for, for the 8th. We've got a problem. Either there was some spectacular jump, which I doubt it was impossible to do that, um, or this record most likely has a problem because it is inconsistent with all of these. Or maybe somebody else collected a specimen and Phillips put his name on it. And to be honest, that's probably what happened because there are little problems with Alan Phillips and stealing specimens from uh, different museum collections. Uh, Phillips is resting in peace right now, so. I'm not accusing anybody of a crime, but if the shoe fits, wear it. Um, so anyhow, these are, these are kind of wild things. And, and to be honest, Adolfo and I analyzed our own collection records from Mexico, and we found one or two errors in our own records, not because we falsified something, but because um, a date or a coordinate had been entered wrong when the data set was captured. And so here is a table showing, here's Adolfo, um, and essentially we made different assumptions about how many days and what, um, what distance we would assume as a maximum travel distance in a day. Uh, I won't go into the details. I'll provide you with the with the the paper that we published instead. But what I want you to see is that 
here in the two or three day or one, two and three day uh, category for these older collectors, especially W.W. Brown, uh, Chester Lamb, Ellen Phillips, there was a lot to be worried about. Uh, there are a lot of inconsistent records that could, not accusing anybody, but could um, include some actual errors. And then here are some simpler ones that probably most everybody can do. We can look at taxon by place consistency. And so when we look at this, here's a, a J, two J species, um, one that's on the west slope of Mexico in cloud forests, and one that's on the east slope of Mesoamerica in cloud forests. And you can see they, in general, they line up in the cloud forest zones of, of Mexico. But for one of these, there's this record. Uh-oh. Anybody know what that is? It's the centroid of Mexico. So probably there was some old record where the only data allow, uh, included was Mexico. And so the responsible georeferencer said, what are the coordinates of Mexico? Well, it's right there in the middle of the Chihuahuan Desert, but it should have a big fat uh, uncertainty radius, which would say it could be anywhere from the northwest corner to the southeast corner of the country. Okay, now you would pick this up by filtering by uncertainty if that record has an uncertainty uh, designation. But right away we can see some geographically inconsistent records in here. Um, so I've, I've talked about that a bit. That's you know clearly the outlier here. Um, but then we can also look at environmental outliers. So here's the other species, the one that's on the west, uh, the west uh, coast of Mexico. And let's look at those. I'm, I'm focusing in right here. Okay. And this is just, just a map of elevations of Mexico. And what you can see pretty clearly is that this is a high elevation species, except for this one record that is down in a valley in the blue areas. Well, let's look at that record more. I'm, I'm worried about it. There it is in terms of elevation. The rest of the species known range is kind of 1,700 to 3,000 meters. And this one record is down at 1,200. That's probably a problem. Let's go look at it. Okay, we've got uh, those are the, the Western records. Those are okay. Here are the Eastern records. And uh-oh, there's that one that was an outlier as far as elevation. It's down in this valley that holds the, the beautiful city of Chilpancingo. And so we have a, an environmental outlier that also is falling under very dubious circumstances. Okay, so I hope that what I've convinced you of is not of a particular workflow, and I certainly didn't give you any uh, R code or anything like that uh, to do this with. I'm just saying get in and play with your data. Get in and explore. Don't trust to other people to put good content where you want good content. Trust yourself and your own eyes only. I'm gonna give you this paper also to look at. It's just an interesting analysis of how a particular data source, maybe it's an herbarium with a million um, specimens, or maybe it's a collection of a few thousand records. But, Alex Asase, Dora Canos, Sidney de Sousa, John Mochorek and I, uh, we analyzed a bunch of herbaria and a bunch of bird collections. And what we documented was massive numbers of data records that are vouchered, they have information, and yet data are being lost. I, I like the term data leakage. 
I'll, I'll illustrate that in a moment. But this is just to give you the idea of um, <clears throat> one collection that we analyze, which is the, the KU Ornithological Collections, which I am which I'm curator. And what you can see is that for taxon, we had very good, very um, standard names that were almost all in authority lists. Not all, there's a small number of problems. Um, in terms of time, most of the time we were, we were good. Um, there were a few cases of missing time information. Uh, and then there were a very few cases of kind of problems. But that, that's, that's the way it is to have a historical collection where not everything has absolutely complete data. Now for place, it's very interesting. This sector um, is endowed with verbatim coordinates, which is to say the data record had some coordinates. It has full text information, but it is lacking all of the metadata and especially the uncertainty. Okay, so those are rescuable data, data records. The yellow also, no coordinates, but full text information. Again, we can go in and with some work, turn those records into full, fully documented place records. The blue ones, about a third of our collection are complete as is. And then we have some records, these orange ones that have no coordinates, but also no textual information. And so what that translates into is this small piece of, the, of our collection, there's no hope for improving the data. And this somewhat larger piece of our collection is completely usable. And then all of this is fixable if the curator and the collections manager are doing the hard work that it takes to, to curate a digital collection. Okay, so I talked about data leakage, and this is kind of the, the, the process. Imagine all of biodiversity out there in the world. Some of it's been sampled. Of that sampling, some of the specimens and data exist, and some have been lost. Things happen. Of the specimens that exist and the records that exist, some have been, in, have been identified, some haven't. Of the ones that have been identified, some have been digitized. Others are just in analog data formats. Of the ones that have been digitized, some have been cleaned and some have not. Of the ones that have been cleaned, some have been georeferenced and some have not. Of the ones that have been georeferenced, some have been published and some have not. Publishing in the sense of making the data record available on the internet. Of the data records published, some adhere to standards like Darwin Core, some have not. Of the data records that adhere to Darwin Core, some have been shared, some haven't. And it's only the data records that make it past all of those leaks do we have a usable data record? And so this tells us a lot of things. First of all, if you're, you know, if you're suffering for data records for a particular species, go deep in what you download from GBIF or VertNet or whichever platform, there are probably a bunch of records that don't have coordinates. And you may be able to do this georeferencing step and rescue all of the records that were going to be lost here. And they will then flow through the system and increase your usable information. It also says, this is kind of an aside, but if you're looking to increase the overall amount of information available, if you fix these leaks, then those data become immediately usable. If you fix these leaks earlier in the chain, those records could be lost as part of downstream data leaks. Okay. 
And of course, there's always more field work to do. Okay, so essentially where that leaves us is this. Imagine flowing by your house out on the street is a main water uh, conduit that's taking many, many, many liters or thousands of liters of water right by your house. But imagine you never get around to fixing your plumbing system and so you have leaks here and there. Well, when you go to take a shower in the morning, you're just gonna get a dribble out of the shower head. And that's because of all this leakage. And that's kind of the way we are with, with biodiversity data. We lose a lot of data because of poor data management. And in fact, we also then get some bad data or wrong data coming through into our models because of wrong data management. And so as Marlon said in the question and answer session last Friday, he's spending double the amount of time cleaning the data as he is analyzing the data. That's about right. Put some time into cleaning up your data. It is crucial. It is important. Okay, I will put uh, these, um, these slides and also all of the papers that I have cited online for you. And I wish you a very good day.